So again, I am Reverend Ajuma Smith Pollard, and I'm program manager for the Cecil Murray Center for Community Engagement. Um, and I'm also part of the Thriving Congregations uh, program that we're running along with my colleague, Richard Flory, and other great staff at the Center for Religion and Civic Culture. Um, on the slide, you'll see my contact information. So feel free to follow me on Instagram or Twitter. I'm not really don't say me much amazing stuff, but you know, you can follow me anyway. Um, and uh, and uh, let's continue to connect. Um, so let me go with our agenda for this morning's conversation. And anyone that's popping in now, go ahead and put your name in the chat. If you're popping in, put your name in the chat and uh, where you are Zooming in from. Anyone that's just joined us, put your name in the chat. Um, and so our agenda for this morning, our agenda for this morning is quite simple, where we will do, of course, a couple of introductions. We will have our panelists do uh, an initial response to one of our prompts. Then we'll do something called a pair share, where each of you will be paired with someone in the Zoom room to talk briefly about one of the questions or one of the prompts. Then we'll come back together again uh, with our panelists to have a full conversation. And then we welcome all of you to join us um, in the Q&A portion. And uh, we hope to not go past the hour and a half commitment, but if we do, that means the conversation is really good. So it is my pleasure, my honor now to introduce uh, my colleague. Um, he is the Senior Director of Research and Evaluation at the Center, USC Center for Religion and Civic Culture. And he's also one of the co-authors of Pocket God. Um, and he is, uh, I was gonna call you Reverend. I was gonna say Reverend Doctor. <laughs> But he is Dr. No. <laughs> he is Dr. Richard Flory. And uh, Richard, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jim. Not that there's anything wrong with being Reverend. My father was a pastor, but that is not me. That's a re that's probably a good explanation of why I'm a sociologist. Uh, although you can read that however you want. Um, good morning, everybody. I, it is great to see everybody. Welcome to our third and that for the spring, our final conversation on thriving congregations. Uh, we're, we're planning more uh, uh, things to do over the, over the next few months. And we'll start up again late summer, early fall. So make sure you keep track in your email from what we're up to. And, and we wanna get you more involved in, in what we're trying to do. So I'm really excited for our conversation today because it brings us full circle to where we started last August with our first conversation on thriving congregations, or more accurately, where we started a year ago when we were first feeling the effects of the pandemic in our daily lives, both individually and corporately. I mean, look, I like to spend time by myself, but this is kind of ridiculous. Um, it also points us though forward to what, could, what only could be understood as a newly shaped world that we're all going to have to learn, learn to live in, no matter what we do or where we live. And as we start today's conversation, I want to just take a minute to think back to a year ago and the uncertainty and the isolation that the pandemic brought with it. In late spring and early March of 2020, I was in Hawaii with my colleague, Nick Street, spending some time with interviewing some several incredible people who, in their own different ways, are living out their internal spirituality and service to their communities, not unlike what we're trying to do here. I distinctly remember watching the increasingly bad news about the coronavirus over the two weeks we were there, including while we were there, the first recorded case in the islands. I started thinking that, man, we're 2,500 miles from home, and I really hope that we could get back without encountering the virus, meaning we had to fly for six hours to get home. And I do remember somebody sitting behind me and coughing and her husband saying, do you want a cough drop? And she said, no. And I'm like, oh, please take a cough drop. Um, and this is before it actually kicked in. I had the feeling as well that things were really going to change in a big way. And about a week later, things did change. The NBA postponed all of its games, which got everybody's attention. And soon after, everything shut down. Businesses and schools, but also churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, and all other in-person opportunities for corporate worship and gathering were stopped. What I found impressive was the skill and speed with which the majority of congregations figure out how to move their services to an online pro platform, even those who had never done it before. And several people I interviewed, they had never live streamed at all, and they just managed to do it. Some had tech staff, most didn't but they relied on the skill sets of their members who, who knew how to do it and they got them more involved in, uh, in, in, in the church services. 
And that was a good thing. Uh, it allowed those members that might not have been as involved in their congregation to bring their knowledge and skills into the service of their community rather than having to hire new staff persons or outside consultants, which would have been cost prohibitive in most cases. But the whole time I kept wondering, how are these faith communities doing all the other things they need to do for their members, such as emotional and spiritual support, caring for the elderly and serving their communities, and indeed being a community of faith when they can't see people face to face? And all of this tapped into a larger question I've had or thought about for a long time, namely, what happens to religion, meaning beliefs and practices and rituals and identity and community, when it becomes almost entirely mediated through digital technology? In 2008, that was a long time ago now, I published a book titled Finding Faith, The Spiritual Quest of the Post-Boomer Generation. And although I was probably, no, definitely too, <laughs> if I think about it, too optimistic about young people and their faith commitments, I did say, manage to say the following in referencing how the formative experiences of young people represent a new way of thinking and acting in the world. And here's what I wrote, probably I wrote this in 2006 or seven to have it published then. The revolution in digital technology has provided access to multiple cultures and worldviews at a click of a button. This exposure has the potential to radically relativize the understanding of truth, or at least to reveal the social construction of belief and value systems. The digital revolution has democratized access to information and images and made that access interactive rather than passive. People aren't just sitting in pews, people aren't just watching television, they're interacting with the media. That is digital technology, computers, cameras, cell phones, and I put in parentheses with cameras like that because that was kind of new still. Photography and filmmaking software is all now relatively inexpensive and in widespread use. You can tell I wrote that before smartphones and all the apps were out. Further, and this is the, the, end, the last paragraph of this, rather than being passive observers of the products of these digital tools, people are now active participants in documenting their experiences and producing, reproducing, and manipulating images, conversations such as on blogs, music, and the like. Thus, music, television shows, and movies are all swapped through digital networks and uploaded to various websites, often with their content manipulated along the way. Digital cameras allow about everyone to be able to make a movie, create a photo essay or exhibit, or just provide a more graphic way to display or sell our goods, including ourselves, which seems to be on sale a lot. And that was 2008. The reality is that this has only accelerated since I wrote those lines. And now everyone from children to grandparents have a smartphone in their back pocket. All right, look, grandparents probably have the little phone holster, but whatever. And I've called those a pocket god in other places because they have this ready at all times and it has information and knowledge, whether that's good or bad, available in ways that we couldn't have imagined 15 years ago. And in the process, it relativizes authority in ways we might not have understood before, whatever that authority is. So more than just tools, digital technology and culture creates a new way of thinking and acting in the world. All of which brings us to the theme of our conversation today. Now that we are one year into having our personal and corporate lives almost completely mediated through tech, digital technology, question arises, what happens to religion? Again, the beliefs, practices, rituals, identity, and community in the process. What effects does do digital media have on how we think about and believe of religion? About how we act based on those beliefs? How can leaders serve their members and their communities when all is mediated through digital means? And what can we learn going forward such that we can still develop and maintain thriving, healthy faith communities? I don't expect us to answer all those questions, but that's the frame that I want us to think about as we go through. Now, before I send this back to Najuma for proper introductions of our panel members, I want to say that we have excellent guides for our conversation today. Professor Heidi Campbell has been researching and writing about digital religion for more than 20 years, including her most recent book, digital creatives and the rethinking of religious authority. And we have two church leaders who have long embodied the necessary spirit, abilities, and mindset to create thriving congregations. There's Bishop John Richardson, who I just met this morning, and then Greg Resinger, all the way from Portland, of actually still in Portland, who I met first in 2002, believe that or not, when I interviewed him at a Soul Survivor event in or at an Orange County campground. And I just want to give you one example of his innovative and service-oriented perspective. Greg is the co-founder of Laundry Love, an international ministry that partners with local groups and laundromats to wash the clothes and beddings of low and no-income families and individuals. And I highly recommend you to check that out as, as a way to think about serving your communities. They have a website, laundrylove.org, 
So I will leave it at that. And on, on that note, Najuma, let's get this conversation rolling. Wonderful. Thank you, um, Richard. That was a, a great, um, a great uh, introduction. So let's get into what we are here for today in talking about uh, technology and innovation. And so we have here a few prompts for our panelists. Um, and what we're going to ask is each of our panelists to um, introduce a little bit about themselves and a little, in a little more in depth, but also answer the question, what becomes of religious authority when everyone carries around their own pocket God? And so our first panelist that we're gonna hear from is Professor Heidi A. Campbell. She is professor at Texas A&M University. Um, there you see the particular URLs that you can find more information about her as well as her Twitter accounts. Um, and so Heidi, welcome and thank you for joining us today. And we'll start with you with the prompt, what happens? Um, what becomes a religious authority when everyone carries around their own pocket God? Thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for coming out to this conversation. Um, so as Richard said, I for the last um, 25 years been studying the relationship between religion, media, and digital culture. And um, the task of kind of introducing my work and giving some comments in five minutes is a bit of a challenge, but I'm, I'm up for it. Um, so my work is focused on what a, a, a academic area study that's called digital religion studies. And so digital religion is looking at how people have used digital technologies and adapted to digital culture within religious communities and groups, but also how they have integrated online and offline um, religious cultures and practices. So um, you know, up on the screen, you see some of the books that I've written about over the last 10 years, looking at different aspects of this theme, anything from how um, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian groups uh, make choices about technology, to how themes of religion are influencing gaming culture and gaming practice, uh, looking especially at digital um, uh, congregations and um, gatherings in, in Judaism. Um, uh, I have some training in theology, so I've done some work in theological reflection in this area. And as you mentioned, my most recent book, looking at the rise of what I call digital creatives. It's a marketing term that of people that kind of make their um, profession in producing media content, developing apps, um, social media platforms. And we see people kind of the both tech professionals um, rising up and using their um, uh, skills for the religious communities they are part of, as well as religious communities seeing the need to empower um, uh, and um, leverage digital media for their congregations and bringing digital um, experts in, into the field and into their communities to help them with this area. So I wanna offer just two short kind of comments that I think really address this issue of kind of authority in digital culture. So back in 2012, I wrote an article that tried to kind of look at how people were practicing religion online and what this might say about the future of religion as far as how people in contemporary culture see religion. And um, I can't talk about all the traits, but two I wanna really highlight right now, one is multi-site reality and the other is shifting authority. So what we've seen, especially in the past year is that Oftentimes, we, especially in religious congregations, it's what we do in our tradition, our offline gatherings, and it's that one space. And then we begin to recognize, well, there's other spiritual conversations happening, resources we can have access to it to maybe supplement our communities. But more and more, we're seeing as the internet is embedded in people's everyday life, they are trying to connect on individual level, the online and offline social as well as spiritual connections they have. And the pandemic kind of brought religious leaders in many congregations forced to deal with that reality and say, how do we blend these spaces? How do we connect them? And what kind of tensions does that create? And one of those tensions is this idea of shifting authority. Um, one of the big fears, and this is going way back to even the 19, um, mid 1990s, when I was beginning to write on this area, that people, were, especially church leaders, were afraid that the internet would cause people to plug in and log out and um, leave offline religious community. But over, this, over the last 20 years, we find that most people don't, if you're um, firmly embedded in a spiritual community or faith tradition, you don't usually leave your um, community or tradition, but what you do is you use digital technology to supplement it. But in that supplementation, you may have more savviness or create more digital content that um, draws attention than your um, faith community. There's been many times where the, uh, the, the thought leaders 
bloggers, social media influencers have a, a better digital presence and, um, uh, and conversation communication style than the actual denomination or community they represent. And so this creates a challenge to traditional religious leaders. But in the last decade, and also because of a lot of experimentation and forced engagement, we're seeing a lot of religious communities seeing the power of digital media and really see that, that it's something that they need to understand in order to solidify their influence as well as kind of really speak to their congregations who are living in this digitally enculturated, embedded world. So over the last um, year, um, I was blessed to be on sabbatical. And just like Richard, I, I found myself in Germany at a research institute, kind of stuck there for a little while before I could get back to the US. Um, and so I did a series of books. We're trying to translate a lot of my work um, for especially religious communities and congregations about what I've learned about how people practice religion online and what this might have to say to different religious leaders. So I did a book, The Distance Church was aimed at uh, church leaders telling their stories of the first three months of the pandemic and how my previous lead, uh, research speak to and give them uh, resources and ideas for how to um, negotiate that. Um, religion in Quarantine is religious studies scholars reflecting on how the pandemic was changing their research, as well as their own experience in their faith communities. And then digital ecclesiology was bringing together a global group of uh, theologians virtually online to have a conversation about what are the deeper theological issues. Um, and these are all available online and I'll provide those links after my um, chat uh, in the chat um, in a few moments. But um, it, it, to kind of synthesize all that work, um, we, my husband, who's also a researcher in church culture and just consulting work, we wrote together this book, What Should the Post-Pandemic Religion Look Like? And this basically summarizes what are the common themes that come out of these three books and all the about 60 different essays that we highlight in there. So I just wanna share two um, takeaways. Oh, sorry. One is that digital innovation and experiences that churches have been going through and faith traditions have been going through should not be seen as a temporary fix. Uh, many people said, well, this is just the stopgap to get us through till we can meet face to face. But I believe that, you know, this digital culture that we've been a part of, it wasn't, wasn't until this last 12 to 14 months that churches began to wake up to the kind of reality that people live in, that they connect through their pocket, um, and their, their social media, um, their religious experiences and their faith communities. And so churches need to kind of, through this time of experimentation, think about how might some of the practices they developed, whether that's becoming the kind of um, uh, small congregations, becoming the kind of, um, uh, internet cafe for their small rural community because they had the most wiring in town or to kind of uh, um, creating online service opportunities um, and uh, worship experiences that might kind of broaden out and their outreach and their um, impact. So we, I, you know, this, I think the digital religion and digital aspect of church is going to continue and should continue in many ways. But one of the things people have learned is that, you know, you can't do religious services in, you know, alone team-based and community-based work is really important. So collaboration and empowering digital creatives, not seeing them as outsiders, but part of the faith community to help leverage and help um, uh, advance in this new digital era is important. And I see that there's, um, I think I, I'm about out of time. So I'm just gonna pause there. Thank you. Wonderful, Heidi, thank you for that. This is, that was great. And um, for anyone, um, we have put up a, uh, in the chat, Richard Flora has put up a link um, for some of these resources. So feel free to we welcome you to take full advantage of those. Our next panelist who will, who will come in and, and introduce a little bit more about his work and um, how he shifted in the pandemic um, and, um, and answer the question, what happens, what becomes a religious authority when everyone carries around their own pocket God? is uh, Bishop uh, John Bishop John Richardson. Um, he is a California New Journey jurisdiction and he'll share more about that. Um, and you'll see his uh, URL there. You can follow him as well on Twitter. Um, welcome Bishop John Richardson to today's conversation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Najuma, my friend, and to um, the University of Southern California. Thank you for this invitation. Um, to participate in this much needed conversation. Uh, I appreciate and welcome the leadership you all are providing to help the church navigate uh, through what I believe will be some challenging days ahead. Um, Easter Sunday was a fantastic day and moment. 
a moment of joy and relief from my perspective, there was a collective uh, mood amid the body of Christ that conveyed, maybe we're getting back to normal. Just maybe we have turned the corner. Maybe this COVID tragedy is coming to an end and perhaps we can resume religious activities and continue where we left off March, 2020. I share that mood. I share everyone's joy and a sigh of relief that things are beginning to point to a possible end of what has been a tragic 12 month period for us all. However, before we can fully transition to what's ahead, we must individually and collectively go on a journey of reflecting and evaluating what happened beyond the obvious. Are there lessons to learn? Is there a message or messages from God to be heard? I'm here to talk about the future and where we go from here, but I must reflect on the last 12 months. Something extraordinary happened something we never witnessed or experienced before. A disease, a virus affected the masses and exempted no one, both rich and poor, educated and uneducated, church and unchurch, lay members and church leaders. No one has been exempt. Also affected were our churches and how we do ministry, our campuses, our physical churches, the place where God supposedly dwell, were closed down suggesting that maybe God was locked out of the life of the church over the last 12 months. We saw God put us on the same level. We all became equals on Sunday morning. Your Sunday attendance was no more or less than mine. All of our pre-COVID efforts to create a worship environment, lighting, sound, band, singers, smoke, i.e. the glory of God, greeters and video displays were no longer needed. These were the items we convinced our constituents to support, believing that God enjoys them. But COVID and the shutdown of our churches made them useless. It was as if God said, uh, said to, to all of us that all of our efforts and money spent for these enhancements are meaningless. God doesn't need them, nor does God enjoy all of our extras. Maybe, just maybe, our worship is not all that impressive to God. Just maybe. God also exposed what I believe is a misinterpretation of scripture, that the temple or some physical location is the only place you can encounter or experience God. For some of us, we grew up believing that forsaking to assemble at a church or a building with pews and chairs and an elevated platform with someone declaring the voice of God is a sin. But guess what? If that's true, we all have been sinners since March, 2020. Over the last year, we've discovered that the infamous, uh, where there are two or three gathered in the name of Christ, doesn't have to meet in a physical location to encounter or experience God. God is universal and within us all. And how we worship the omnipresent God should not be limited to our imaginations, our past practices. We should feel liberated and free to worship God in the beauty of holiness in a creative and limitless way. I conclude my opening remarks with a gentle warning. It would be a tragedy if one year later, after going through living hell, political crisis, racial wars, riots, quarantines from, from loved ones, deaths of friends and family, that we celebrate the ending of COVID by a resumption of where we left off in March 2020. If we do, we will fail the succeeding generations that will study our past year for centuries to come. They will all conclude we missed the big picture and could not grasp the great message. COVID, the great disruptor of our lives, was more than a brief respite or a moment to wait for its passing patiently. The last 12 months have indeed been a great tragedy, but it, but it has also been a moment God has given to us a fresh start to do things differently in a way we have never done them before. The Easter story is about the God man who dies on a Friday, but arises on a Sunday morning with new life and power. Maybe the Easter story is more connected to what has happened over the last year than at first glance. I believe that the church we have all known is dead. It died in March, 2020. What was is not coming back. But just as the God-man died and resurrected three days later, maybe, just maybe, 
Easter of 2021, one year later, after what I believe was the church death, will become our resurrection story. Perhaps God is giving you and me in 2021 new life and power to embrace new ways and avenues to do ministry, create community, serve and love humanity, and worship the God who has been gracious to us. Thank you. Thank you for that, Bishop um, John. That was really amazing. And uh, thank you for just breaking that down for us. Um, I have a, a question and I want everybody to tell the truth. Who had smoke at that church? <laughs> Tell the truth, put in the chat. I want to know. I want to know who had the smoke. I want to know. <laughs> Tell the truth, who had the, glory, the smoke. No, it's Represent, the glory of God. The glory. the glory of God. Who had the smoke? I want to know. Tell the truth, put it in the chat. <laughs> that is great. Thank you, Bishop. But that was that was a great breakdown. And so we appreciate you sharing with us. Um, and our third panelist, certainly Knight Pillar. Okay, not much smoke. Wonderful, Marty. Thank you for being honest. Um, and our third panelist, um, and we're so glad to have him on, again, will answer or give some redress to the question, what becomes of religious authority when everyone carries around their own pocket God? Um, he is the pastor of culture and formation founder, formation, he is the founder, I'm sorry, and pastor of culture and formation alongside his church and laundry love. Um, there you see on the screen his uh, URLs so you can follow as well as a Twitter handle and he is pr uh, Pastor Greg Ressinger. Pastor Greg, we welcome you and thank you for joining us this morning. Yeah, hello. It's uh, grateful to be with you, my fellow panelists. Uh, though we've never met in person, I did go to the interwebs to learn more about you and from what I've learned, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, to the viewing audience who share this journey with us, welcome. Thank you, Richard Flory, for the invitation to participate and the long history that we share. I've been a pastor for over 25 years, and I currently participate in and with a Christian faith community known as Alongsiders in Portland, Oregon, where I serve as pastor. And for the last 18 years, I've also led a national nonprofit called Laundry Love, a human care initiative that washes the clothes and bedding of low to no income families and persons around the US. Uh, I've been married for 27 years, I have two children, both graduating this year, one from university and one from high school. Um, I can confidently confess, this is the first time I've pastored in and through a global pandemic. And like many of you, I've learned, I've adapted, I've made quick pivots. I've sat with others in the dust of grief and loss. I've walked with my black brothers and sisters in peaceful protests and the want for justice. I've spent more time in front of a screen than ever before. And I've come to love wearing sweats. I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed purchasing more and more sweats. Uh, in 1966, sociologist Edward T. Hall published a book called The Hidden Dimension. Uh, his research was on people's use of space, uh, the space that they maintain among themselves and their fellows and that they build around themselves in their cities, their homes and their offices, hoping to increase self-knowledge and decrease alienation and some to help introduce people to themselves. Hall coined the term proxemics for the interrelated observations and theories of people's use of space. Hall concluded that there are four spaces we use to develop personalities, culture, and communication. Those spaces are public, social, personal, and intimate. And each of these spaces comes with a reference to distance. In the public space, it's 12 feet plus. In the social space, it's four to 12 feet. In the personal, it's 18 inches to four feet. And in the intimate, it's zero to 18 inches. Now, within each of these distance zones, Hall noticed how diverse communication was from volume to facial expressions, linguistic styles, as well as the closeness of bodies. In 2003, Joseph Myers released a book called The Search to Belong. Joseph uh, uh, Myers took Hall's research and developed one of the better books on belonging and group life. Uh, using Hall's proxemics theory, Miles uh, Myers suggests these four spaces communicate how we belong to each other. Myers describes at times and encourages the church to honor the four spaces that people travel when they seek to belong. 
Some people feel comfortable and safe within the public space, the 12 feet plus, and these can be considered uh, weekly gatherings or events, while others still want to venture into the social or personal space, small groups or serving on teams, etc. The idea is to create all four spaces so people can choose and not be forced into a space they are not ready for. Then in 2016, John MacArthur, who's associate professor in the James L. Knight School of Communications at Queen's University of Charlotte, authored a book called Digital Proxemics, How Technology Shapes the Way We Move. And MacArthur investigates the role of digital technology and communication in proxemics and how the role of digital technology in our lives has complicated or relationally or created more complex experiences, relationality or multifaceted or in ways that we connect with each other or changed how we understand space and connection. And I would add how digital technology has either complicated or opened us to new ways, forms, and opportunities in spiritual formation, community belonging, and neighborly engagement. Now, as a pastor, I've found the study of proxemics, uh, proxemics to be a helpful reminder and a necessary challenge in and through 2020 and continuing into 2021. And as we know, the digital and physical are continually merging. And as culture changes, so does proxemics. Um, and so how we connect, how we relate, how we coexist, how we lead, how we guide is really uh, up for questions and examination. And so for me, these last 14 and 15 months have offered both excitement and exhaustion, ideation and irritation, pause and purpose, and have birthed questions like, how do people belong in this time? How do people thrive spiritually and personally? How do people stay grounded and present? How do people stay awake and active to the challenges in their cities, neighborhoods, and towns? How has gathering, liturgy, and formation shifted or evolved? And how essential is human proximity in light of what we're living in and living through? What we're discovering in Portland and discerning together focuses on decentralization, shared culture, and local expression. And all of this, this year, we have chosen to launch what we're calling Alongside Our Studios, creative communities that are both physical and digital and diverse in size, as well as geographical space. Um, I'm really looking forward to sharing more, as well as listening well to uh, and engaging with my fellow pan panelists, as well as you, the audience. So it's really great to be here. Thanks for having me. Pastor Greg, thank you. And I would concur. Um, I would agree with you on the sweatsuits. I actually did something that I have not done in years. I went to the Nike store. And so this jacket really is, a, is the jacket to a brand new sweatsuit. <laughs> so I'm guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. I thought, I said, well, at least I'll buy a fancy one. They won't, they won't know it's a sweatsuit. <laughs> and it has Nike. So, you know. Uh, but <laughs> I'm wearing a t-shirt and a sweater. I do have a sweater on though. <laughs> right. So, you know, so we, we understand the new the new gear has really uh, taken on a, a twist. Uh, but again, so let's do we're going to go into our pair share. And thank you for all of our panelists for opening up the discussion and uh, giving everyone a little insight about who you are and what you do and the great work that you're doing um, um, here in, in and around uh, California and abroad. Uh, so now we're going to invite each of you into a pair share. So you will see a pop up on your screen um, and the screen is going to invite you into a room and you're going to, with your partner, answer the same question that we asked each of our panelists to address. And you'll be in there for a moment and then you'll see at the top of your screen, if you've not done a pair share before, at the top of the screen, it'll give you a countdown so you'll know when we're gonna be brought back into the room. And then that's when we'll have a broader conversation uh, with all of our panelists and Dr. Flory. And then we'll do, we'll close out with a Q&A um, with all of you engaged in the conversation. And so we're gonna ask um, our CRCC staff person to set us up. So you should see a prompt and go ahead and click join. And, um, and then you can do your pair share. Thank you. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed their pair share. Let's hear from a couple of people. Um, right. 
you, uh, we'd like to take a couple of folks to share and then also put in the chat anything that may have come up in your pair share that you uh, want to share with everyone else. But let's take a couple of individuals. Go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, just share um, what come out, came out of your conversation. And then we'll get into the broader discussion with all of our panelists. If we can get a couple of people to share uh, with us. And then also feel free to use the chat if something came up for you that um, you want to share with the broader audience. Uh... Uh, I can say that we were focusing a little bit on Bishop John's comment, and that sort of sounded like in Lutheran we saw Adi offer, you know, what is core and what is what is the stuff around it, and whether it's the band and smoke or a high church liturgy or whatever it is, it's the stuff around it. So how do we claim what is core and make mm -hmm. sure that that goes into all forms? Like if we're doing digital, you know, if we're doing hybrid, um, what does that all look like, and how do you? How do you take the best of the past into the future, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of piece. Thank you, Marjorie. I appreciate it. And Damien, I see your hand is up. Mm -hmm. Is that Gedry? Am I saying that last Gedry, name? close yeah. enough. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Please share. Um, yes, I am wearing sweatpants. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we talked a little bit about the fact that um, the algorithm is the authority. We have mm -hmm. to think about it that way. We have to remember that's one of the things that's really defining what shows up on that screen. That's it. Wow, that's deep. And yeah, that's true. And um, and I know like just, I'm a social media person and, and I think Heidi, you were talking about your work around uh, digital creators and content creators. And that's the thing, like we're all, you're always trying to kind of figure out the algorithm, like what's the algorithm doing today? And it seems like this, it's ever changing. Um, any other final thoughts? And then we're gonna go back to our panelists, anything else? And again, feel free to use the chat if there's something, if you have a question. Um, uh, someone wrote, who's questioning authority? So we'll, we'll ask our panelists um, that. But any other shares from our pair share? Wayne Hopkins has his hand up. Oh, Wayne and then Susan. Go ahead, Wayne, and then Susan. So, so one of the things that happened with us, we're a smaller community in South Central Los Angeles. Um, and when I first came to the church five years ago, I was taking pictures uh, because well, I, I wanted to document my experience as a new pastor. Uh, and people, they thought it was novel. But when we came online, you know, on Zoom 56 weeks ago, I mean, I've kept track of it. Uh, I was able to incorporate those pictures into our PowerPoint presentation, and it felt like the people were together. They got to see themselves on the screen, and that became like a real, a real drawing point. You know, who's going to make it to the slideshow? Uh, and and I was afraid it might be a little divisive, but it actually was encouraging, and people started to send pictures in. That was something that you know, technology had just wasn't a part of the world that we lived in before this and now it sort of brought us all together so uh, just grateful to be a part of this thank you guys today for for allowing me to share thank you wonderful and then susan thank you for that and i, I know that's uh, something that we do here before you for all of you all of our guests came on today our staff we take a um a picture and with our panelists we take a picture as well and document uh, what we're doing. So that's a great idea. Um, I believe, Susan, you had your hand up. Yeah. And thank you everyone for putting your thoughts into the chat and we'll have our, our panelists kind of give redress to some of those thoughts and questions. Um, my partner, Nancy Hall and I uh, tried very hard to stick to the question, but we too were very moved by Bishop Richardson's comments. And when it came to down to it, we found that uh, we had a common experience is that we both were in churches that felt right away that the necessity was that we needed to reach out to each and every member and identify their need. So it was the church going out of the church to the members. And in both cases, we had churches where we participated in telephoning. I guess that pocket God <laughs> took us um, to speak with every member of the church to identify their need um, and then work very hard to uh, identify those who were most in need, whether it be for some kind of assistance or if it was a spiritual need. Yeah. and spend the past year making certain that they were partnered in ways 
um, that we continued to meet those needs. Um, and it included everything from tech assist, if they were having difficulty making use of the digital opportunities to things like groceries and rides to medical appointments. But um, yeah, God went out of the church for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for that, Susan. And thank you for everyone for putting your thoughts and questions in the chat. So I'm gonna ask, invite our panelists um, to maybe just give some redress to some of the comments heard, or if you see something in the chat that you wanna address, and then we'll get to our prompts. We have a couple more prompts that we wanna lift up, but I wanna give our, our, our panelists and you too, uh, Dr. Flory, if you wanna give redress to any of the thoughts that have been shared so far. I wanted to make a couple comments just on the idea of algorithmic authority and just, you know, how, you know, how do we understand authority in digital culture? So, you know, one of the challenges, and I, I write about this in my, my most recent um, academic book, is that, you know, of church is we understand authority based on it's on your expertise it's on knowing the institution it's on you know even divine or human kind of um uh, uh setting aside so it's very much on kind of structure history tradition very um concrete ways but digital culture it's prominence and visibility so you know you raise you you're raised to a, a position of authority because people see you they can they can ac access you easily and um you uh, have a widespread it doesn't be it's you know what you be saying could be in theologically incorrect or could be um you know actually untruth um maybe even not deliberately on your your part but because of that um and i think this is what's happened you know not just around the pandemic but was happening before that it's there's this tension between the church uses certain definitions of a community and communities are defined by people in the church by membership contracts by geography and digital culture says we don't use those same boundaries and so there's this kind of tension that's happened between this you know the church is saying well this is what membership is this is what community this is what how we how we how we do what we do and who should have the voice if in the community and digital culture doesn't work like that and so it creates internal tensions and sometimes especially when it comes to like you know uh, you know talk to your ki kids in your youth group you know they aren't listening to the youth pastor or the pastor for religious advice they're listening to their peers or people online it's about, uh, basically it's kind of this kind of who do I have an affinity with who do I have a relationship with and so it changes the notion of kind of how we treat community and authority. And I think it's, you know, it, this was happening before the pandemic, but I think it's got accentuated and even encouraging kind of people to kind of move from one community to another because of this community gets how social in identity works and how relationship work in digital culture. And this one doesn't. And especially for, I think, millennials and Generation Z. I'll pause there. And before we move, because I, I think that's really I, key. And I, in our shop, people tend to call me the director of reality, which is like, yeah, let's see what the data says. And I think that what Heidi's talking about and, and what in her book and what she just mentioned there and all these tensions underneath about what is authority for individuals in the pew and in culture and our neighborhoods is radically shifting. And it's not, unless she says it's not just in the last year, but that's just sort of heightened the experience of it. And um, I mean, I have a a colleague of mine and I published a book a year ago on, on emerging adults and religion. And the title of the book is Back Pocket God. I mean, that's where God has gone. And it's not, he's not a prominent, prominent part of most young people's lives, no matter where they are on the religiously committed scale. There is just another, it's just another thing they do if they do it. And on average, they don't. So that raises this question, I think, that Heidi's at, at, and I think is really important for this discussion of how do you create and maintain thriving congregations in the face of all this competition, frankly, that people carry around with them mm -hmm. uh, for their attention, for their time, for who, what they think is right and wrong, uh, what, what they think is authoritative. Um, it's, it's, it, it, it is a challenge, to put it mildly, for, for congregations and leaders like you all to, to figure that out. And that's what I want to hear really is like, how does that work? And what are you experiencing? And, and what solutions are you kind of circling to, to figure this out as, as we go forward? <laughs> Thank you um, for that. You know, we have some thoughts in the in the chat, I think would be great for us to address. Um, so Mark Lau Branson, thank you, Mark, says, uh, Jason Fikes and I talked about not losing the opportunity 
Churches may become more gathering centric. For some, local neighbor connections have increased. So how do we not lose that? And Pastor Greg, I'll start with you and then Bishop and then Heidi, uh, if you want to jump in. Um, let's have a conversation about these questions that have been put in the chat for us. Yeah, great question, Mark. Um, I, you know, think for us personally, I can only speak from my own experience. Uh, we, we have always um, pushed against Sunday centric ex experiences or expressions of our collective faith. So we understand that gathering has an importance to the faith experience, but we don't put all of who we are in that basket. And so we have, you know, focused heavily on neighboring. What does that look like in the context that we live in? Why does that matter? Uh, listening well to the geographical space that we're in, how to build a relational equity over time. And, um, and so thankfully, you know, a lot of when all of this transpired, you know, we shut down our, you know, in-person gatherings, if you will, at the beginning of March last year and have, you know, stayed that way until actually just you know, since the Easter time of this year. Um, but our relational equity, our relational bond um, had remained solid and true within the neighborhood context that we're in. Also, because of our focus towards uh, neighborhood care and neighboring, we use both the digital technologies as well as the physical to really make sure that we are coming alongside our neighbors that are struggling with either food insecurity, uh, loneliness, or the difficulties of aging. And, um, and so we were present in those spaces, um, you know, uh, you know, abuse, um, because of obviously everybody trapped inside their spaces. So, you know, we, we were able to um, not have to pivot, but we just adapted some of the things that we were already doing to be present to others that were facing some challenges uh, in this COVID experience. And so um, I think for us, our property has always been used for community. And so that has allowed us to have um, kind of a deep uh, integration and relational viability uh, with the neighborhood uh, and the, you know, one, two, three, four, five mile radius that our piece of property sits in, in the Northeast of Portland area. But it's a great question. I think it's an important question. Um, I think it's, because <clears throat> I think to some degree, and not to take up too much time here, but I really think that outside of all of what we've learned in this, I think we've learned that that liturgy and sacrament and being together is still important. But the idea of property is, does that make a question mark? Um, you know, because we've found ourselves in all of these different spaces through this last year, and we've learned together to live from either our homes or whatever it might be, right? And and so now, you know, for us, we're having the conversation about okay, what is the what is the need and the use of property? Why does that matter? And how can we, you know, shift our focus towards making sure that. Uh, neighbors and neighborliness and uh, all of that matters in, in greater ways for us personally. So great question. Thank you, Pastor Greg. Bishop John, did you want to add to that? Um, your thoughts? Yeah. On how do we not lose? He's, he's muted. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. You know, I was thinking how um, early on uh, we were uh, we were blowing it so so to speak. We 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 were behind in reacting to the various needs of our constituents. We need to shift. There's something else that we need to do more than just having a worship experience or having some songs on camera and me preaching a message and that was it. We we recognized we were blowing it. And so we uh, contracted with a Christian counseling group uh, who began to provide online counseling services to our congregation and to the pastors that I oversee from, from merit, marital to family counseling. Uh, we started various support groups. Um, those who was going to work, still having to work during the, uh, during the crisis, um, they could get on Zoom and be able to interact with each other 
of those who were grieving over loved ones. We created support groups for them. Uh, each week, the, the counseling group would provide teaching, but then at the end of the lesson, they would kind of do some one-on-one -on -one stuff with individuals. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this, you know, we've learned as we've, we, we've kind of taken this journey, but uh, one of the, I think the, the, the challenges for churches is can we adjust and adapt and move quickly when things happen? We, we're, we're not gonna know everything. We're not gonna get it right the first time, but can we adjust quickly? And that's what we had to do um, to be able to uh, meet the needs of our constituents. Thank you for that. Um, Heidi? And then we're going to take a question from Mark. Um, Mark had another, no, I'm sorry, not Mark. We had another question here. Go ahead, Heidi. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just want to pick up on two things that Bishop Richardson said. One is, you know, I really kind of um, uh, agreed strongly with what he said in his introduction about, you know, this being an important time for the church for self-reflection. I mean, it's something I really kind of sense uh, really full on, not just as someone who researches, you know, religion and religious culture and digital technology, but, you know, on a former life, I was a pastor. And so looking at, um, you know, what was happening, I really kind of felt it was God's way to kind of shine a light on things in European and uh, in European and North American church culture that we've just kind of taken as as the uh as the basis you know how do we evaluate church vitality it's you know people it's attendance and money in the plate and you know it's again it puts a centric thing on, on the vitality of a church being what happens in that moment of the service um you know and realizing that is just one that should be the, maybe a center gathering piece that spurns out and I think a lot of churches, well, they say, going, oh, no, our church is out about outreach into other communities. If you look at the number of pastor hours are spent preparing for the service, volunteer hours, programming hours, resources, I would say probably 80% of that energy goes into the church. And, and I, I do work, you know, um, ethnography where we've developed a model. We do an analysis of this is what your, your, your identity is online through your website and your digital products. This is what, when we do go into your church, this is what we see. And this is what your mission statement is. And let's look at the connections, you know, there. And, you know, as a researcher, you know, we see a lot of disconnect between the performance of identity um, and the actual man hours and the kind of the, the tradition one comes from. And I think that, you know, that, that, that this has been a great wake up time for people to evaluate. And the second thing, just to experiment. I mean, churches want to, you know, like a lot of institutions, we want to get it right before we go out there. But the digital world is all about beta testing. You put it out and it may be half-baked, but you know that, that the users are going to help you. And rather than seeing experimentation as a threat, you know, the church has always had to adapt to culture over time, but quick ad adaptation, not a strength of the church <laughs> in the last hundred years. But I think more and more people have gone through that process and gone through that discomfort this year. And I think that's something they should embrace to see how trying different things and even reorienting priorities and how services are done is a vital thing in this, this day and age. You know, that's great that you mentioned it, Heidi, because uh, Damien put in the chat, I don't think we're doing a good job of digital listening. For lots of people, the question is more important than the answer. Digital platforms are great for doing research and we're not taking that opportunity. I think that's what you're also saying, Heidi, about paying attention to the data and uh, Damien calls it digital listening. So um, any, uh, any additional thoughts on that? If not, then we'll kind of move forward with some of our other prompts that we have. But that was great. Thank you, Damien. Thank you, Heidi. Um, so we have a couple of the prompts that we'd love for our, um, our panelists for you all to, to, to chime in on and let's have a conversation about. We've got about another 25 minutes or so. Um, so what changes in how we think about church and gathering together need to be made so as to take into account the new realities and to maintain and even increase the sense of community and belonging that all thriving congregations have? What changes in how we think about church? and gathering. And Heidi, we'll start with you and then we'll go to the others. Well, again, I think is, you know, one of the, um, uh, there was a survey that was done um, uh, by, I think it's the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. One thing they found during the pandemic is people were using social media, Zoom, uh, YouTube, and the social media platforms this term, wow, we're doing the service and, and you know, it's not building community. You know, it has likes, it has these things that are social built into it, but it's not really revitalizing, revitalizing community. 
Um, and so we're realizing that just because you're using digital media doesn't mean you're going to create an interactive, vital space. Right. But at the same time, is uh, many of these churches were also just transferring their service online. They put the smartphone or the camera, and it, they, they were critiquing the technology. But what they should have been critiquing is the service. You know, just because we're gathered in one physical space doesn't mean we have community. And maybe it's about, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, um, you know, when people had to shift the focus from just the service to realizing we had to build those connections, checking up on one another, networking, thinking about how we outreach the community and using other resources and technologies to do that. I think that's kind of a thing of thinking about, okay, what is happening in our offline tradition? And are we willing to be self-critical a little bit, even if it's uncomfortable, to see where we might be able to extend and um, rethink practices? Wonderful. Um, Craig or Bishop John, if you have some additional thoughts around that, that prompt, what changes? <laughs> that is a, uh, whoo, that's a tough question. Uh, changes. Um, you know, just a point of transparency. Um, we you just made a huge change. You made a huge change. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. just, we just completed a building program where we spent a lot of money creating a new building a brand new campus from the ground up and now this campus is nothing but an expensive studio <laughs> there is no one here and there's no there's no one been here for over a year and basically my wife and i and there's some lights here and we got all of the the the, the all of the, the, you know, the material make video happen. But we were, you know, I, I had a moment where I said, did we actually spend a number of years and all of this money to build a campus and it's really useless at this time? Mm -hmm. that, was, that was a painful reality for me that all the effort that we have put into this COVID exposed it that it was, it was useless. And we began to reinvent uh, ministry. We began to think differently and say to ourselves, is it really about the campus or is it really about ministry? Is it about touching people? And do we actually need four walls to do that? Do, do we actually need a mortgage? Do we actually need the landscaping and all of the things that normally come with beautiful campuses. Do we really need that to impact people's lives? And the answer to that was painful. We don't, we don't need that. We don't need the mortgage. We don't need all of that. What we need is to find a way, find ways to minister to people. So one of the things that we did was that we moved from a church that is doing outreach to an outreach that happens to have a church service. Um, and that church service is online. We've also developed a television station. And we've basically are, have said that we're going to minister, one of the aspects of our ministry is going to be ministering through the TV. And, and just follow me and I'll be real quick. The online presence is so busy. Everybody is online. Mm -hmm. So you got 99.9% .9 of all churches probably are conducting some type of online church service. So it's like going fishing and it's a small pond and it's like a thousand people throwing their lines in there. <clears throat> it's going to be hard to impact a, a, the masses, so to speak. So we basically have said, and then from online, when I'm online, I don't know about you all, my attention span is not that great, okay? So I'm just clicking, clicking, clicking. Uh, article that is over 30 seconds to 60 seconds, I'm gone, okay? That's too long for me. So the, you know, just that part. So I figured, we came to a conclusion that people are more inclined to spend a little bit more time watching TV. It, it's just a natural thing. And so we have shifted to that um, and not only do the preaching, but also we have secure titles, Christian movies and stuff like that. So we're just expanding to try to reach 
a, a greater group of people. I know I'm taking too much time, but I could talk about this all day. So <laughs> I'm gonna stop right there. I'm gonna stop right thank there. You. Thank you, Bishop John. No, this is good um, because I think what you're saying ties into um, a comment that Burge, uh, and I hope I don't mess up your name, said uh, they write so far, it's more about religion online than online religion. Many churches of various denominations are not willing to think of developing active online services different than the traditional in-person physical ones they had since ever or since forever, I guess that's what they're saying. In other words, we just kind of transferred what we were doing in person, yeah, yeah. put online, yeah, as yeah, opposed yeah, to yeah, thinking yeah, yeah. Right, about right. how do I make this interaction more, inter you know, more interactive and at the same time creating community that we're talking about and connecting with people. Uh, uh, Pastor Craig, Greg. Yeah, um, I'm just reading some of the threads here. Yeah. Um, maybe uh, would you just go ahead and ask me that question again, just so I, make sure. I was just I was just wondering if you had any additional <laughs> thoughts around, you know, how church how and I think to Bishop John's point is how churches have not really made changes. They a lot of times they just take what we were doing in person to and also to Burge's point, we took what was in person just kind of put online as opposed to thinking critically and using the technology to create something that's interactive and engaging that creates community, but also um, to Damien's point, which like serves the needs and of the people. Yeah. So I just wanted yeah. to add thoughts around additional comments, just, thought, conversation. Yeah, just a stream of consciousness here. Um, you know, when we were in the midst of uh, last year, um, there are certain practices that we knew that we wanted to continue. Um, we wanted to continue the sacrament of the Eucharist and encourage every person that wherever they were at to participate with that. And the, and the funny parts of those stories is some people had bread, some people had wine, some people had, you know, pop tarts, some people had milk, <laughs> like they just got whatever they could to go ahead and participate in that sacrament that it was central to our uh, faith community's expression. The other thing in that was um, what we did is that we made sure that there was moments of a personal as well as collective engagement. And what I mean is that if there was any reflection that I was bringing or one of the other pastors were bringing uh, for that uh, that day, that we in the middle of that broke it open and just offered this moment of engagement. It was like three to five minutes. We created some questions that were prompts for people to go ahead and reflect. And the way that we do our reflections or encourage people is that they have to pay attention to what's happening in them, not necessarily pay attention to what I'm saying or somebody else is saying, but what's being stirred within them. And then for them to pull back and to process uh, through the prompts or their own sense of what they're hearing inside themselves with those that are in the room. Um, and if they weren't with other people in the room, that they would take three to five minutes to be quiet, journal, process that. And so we did engagements, we call it engagements, each and every time that we had gathered, when we gathered, just to make sure that people weren't just looking at a screen, but they were taking the time in that 20, 25 minute reflection to pull back and continue just to make sure that they're listening to what's happening in them and either processing that outwardly with those in the room or doing that individually with themselves. And so we, we wanted to make sure that there were moments where we did cut away from the screen, if you will, and make sure that we, um, you know, we reconnected with our own physical person or we reconnected with other people that were with us in the room at that time. And there were, you know, different things that we tried to make sure that that was happening in these moments that we were gathering digitally. I think for us, we've always had a very, very strong culture towards uh, mercy and justice. And so, you know, the thing I maybe many of you that are watching realized is though you physically weren't gathering, you were still physically being present to those that were suffering. And so once again, with our efforts of, within the BIPOC community or those that are, you know, food insecure or our laundry love efforts nationally, we were still physically present through uh, efforts of compassion or mercy or justice. And um, <laughs> even though we had pivoted and adapted and we didn't, luckily for us, we didn't have adapt too much, but though the, the technological side of us was enhanced, our physical presence remained just as strong. And I don't know about many of you watching, but I imagine that's the case as well, that if you are committed to your neighbors, 
that are struggling or suffering. I'm sure that in this season, you found yourself more present physically, masked up and doing all that you need to do to take care of people. We also use digital ways to do that. Uh, through text messaging, they could text the word care. Anybody could text the word care to 855-909-1199 and fill out the form of how they need to be cared for. And we would show up and drop off whatever they needed. So there was different ways that we use technology as well as we were physically present. And I think that's important for us because part of our culture, and I think even in the diversity of who we are and the fact that we're in different locations, our culture kept us together. And I think if you have a very strong culture, a reason of existence, and that you live, your language, your behaviors wrapped around your culture, that can help you maneuver through these moments, and it helped us maneuver through ours. And the last thing I would say, and I'll just use this uh, scriptural um, idea um, in Luke chapter 17, verse 11, it says that when Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he traveled along the border of Samaria and Galilee. Now, Galilee obviously was home, right? The, the 10 cities, it was home. It's where he grew up and where he was formed. Galilee was the, the place of conflict, the place of historical conflict, the place of difference, the place of other. And he traveled along that border. And I imagine one foot in one side, one foot in the other action, contemplation, uh, digital, analog. I don't care how you do it, but I, I think we're all in this moment. Now we're learning what it means to be border walkers in our imagination or our practice of how do we live within the digital and the analog space? You know, How do we make sure that we're both physically present to somebody as well as we're picking up the phone or texting or Marco Poloing or whatever we've been doing? So I think the fact is we're learning to become the both and people that maybe all along we should have been. And and, uh, but now we're having this invitation based on what we're experiencing to lean in that and participate, maybe not in a new way under the sun type of thing, but a new way to uh, uh, for us, whoever us is. And so those are just some things that we've learned along the way, both as it relates to gather and being present in mercy and justice. And we, we're committed to being border walkers, whatever that might be. Uh, and that's part of our culture. I like it, that border walkers. That's that's powerful. Um, you want to say something, Dr. Flory? Yeah, I just think I mean this is fantastic, and I, I'm as I'm listening to all these comments, it strikes me that there's a common thread across them all, and which is always impresses me about people that that are able to adapt, and that's a that's a that's a term I've I've worked with for my entire career, which was I don't I I was never satisfied with from sociology perspective. I've never been satisfied with the secularization theory. I see religion as adapting over time, and so my question is, how does that happen? And we're seeing a particular interesting time now. And what I see and hear today are some underlying principles that are important to be able to adapt, which is you need to be thoughtful before crisis hits. You need to be connected. You need to listen. You need to be prepared to, um, to adapt and change. And, and still, you're able to do that within, within the space of your own tradition without moving outside the tradition, but pushing the edges of that tradition. And I think that that is really, in a lot of ways, what we're talking about in terms of what makes a thriving congregation. I have some other final thoughts that in a, when we get to that point, but I think right now it's like this notion of thoughtfulness, listening, paying attention to your neighbors, paying attention to your people and you're in the, well, they're not in the pews anymore, but uh, maybe, they're, maybe they're going back to the pews, but you know, people in your church, um, what are you hearing? What are their needs? What can you do with them and, so, and for them, but with them as well? I think that partnership is a part of this whole digital revolution because people, it's, it's not so much top down anymore. I mean, Heidi is bringing this up in multiple ways. It's, it's, you know, it's an interactive process, which really complicates, but also provides lots of new opportunities. And, I, and if I can jump in, Richard, with you here on that, and, and maybe some, Heidi, you've discovered this in your own research, but um, you know, we're a multi-generational community. So you have older communities, I'm talking about 80 years old, 90 years old, that did not, never got into the whole Wi-Fi internet world. And so what happens when COVID hits and these people are isolated because they're widowed or whatever, and we have to quickly adapt and pivot to care for that community. And what we went back to was 
pressing DVDs and we purchased every single one of these widowed individuals. The old, like, you know, the whole like screen with a DVD yeah. that's connected. The portable to one. Thing. Dude, we found those in, we found those in Best Buy. Like we tracked those down and we purchased like almost, I don't know, 10 or whatever. And we went around and delivered those and start shipping DVDs. So all to say, you know, in these moments, I, I feel like there's these like analog digital, you know, Back you know, interplaying you're you're, you're back. back and forth yeah i think i think that's definitely been kind of part of what we've uh experienced and and i think it's it's been good to us it's been it's been refreshing to us it's it's woke us up to things that uh are important how you care and come alongside people in a way that matters to them and mm -hmm. what their situation yeah, yeah. this is good this is a great conversation great conversation we're having i want to i want to lift something real quick um wayne puts in here about content is key and i want to i want to i want to invite our our panelists and even you dr flory um, talk about content and and how congregations uh, we've had to not only just make these shifts in how we serve and then provide service, but also how we all have become, like it or not, content creators. And how does that impact the culture and life of the local church? Because I don't we you know we've had to like become content creators different than preachers and worshipers we've also had to add a, a line on there whether we did it consciously or not content creators and heidi i know you write about this but i also want to hear craig and bishop john and, and dr flory and then i think we'll wrap up uh, with some final q a um and to your point dr flory you you mentioned some questions that we need to ask and damien says this if we don't answer these questions technology doesn't matter so that, that's great. So Heidi, go ahead. Talk to us about content creation. Well, I would kind of push back on that a little bit and say okay. that, you know, um, the, I, I, that, you know it, this is the challenge of kind of network culture. Network culture builds communities that are based on individuals. The individual is the center of the community and they create their network. And in that kind of space, content is king because it's all about the broadcast. It's all about that. But churches are called to be communities of faith and orientation. And I think digital media also allows us to build relationship builders and relationship um, connections. And I think that that's what really kind of needs to be the focus. How can we use these technologies and spaces to build a community? You know, um, I, I said this back in, in 1999 when I was doing my PhD research and I still stand by that, you know, what are people looking out, out for online? They, it's the words of the, the TV song from Cheers. They want to go where everybody knows their name and they're glad they came mm -hmm. and you know the you know you can have a not so great sermon but if people feel cared for invested in and given a purpose to go out and, and connect with other people they are going to keep coming back if you just give a great sermon and great content and great chances to like or comment you know that's going to be fine until the next fancy trend comes along so mm -hmm. i think it's about kind of not just the content but the content is the placeholder to draw but it's not to keep them there Absolutely. Thank and I, you. There was a there was a Barna poll, maybe, gosh, easily 10 years ago, maybe not quite that long ago. <laughs> I don't remember the exact numbers, but basically is that like some huge number of people that went to church cannot remember the topic of the sermon the previous <laughs> Sunday. I mean, they have no clue what the sermon was about. And I wrote about that in a blog piece that I wrote on and and, and I was like, well, yeah. Because that's not that's not really why they're there. They're there for all these other things, which when I was growing up, we were told you shouldn't be in church for your friends. When in fact, I'm like, yeah, you should. That's why you should be there. So it's like, what are the things around that you're creating that draw people in? Because, and I'll, I'll bring in this other piece from, from this Back Pocket God book. It's like the, the young people who manage to stay committed in their religious faith, whatever their tradition had a strong home environment which in which religion was a key component. Parents modeled it. They went to church with them and, and other, not just church, but you know what I mean. Um, it, was, it was a key part of their home life and their personal lives. Mm -hmm. And so it's like it created this, and, and then that linked up with the religious community. So these kinds of spaces support each other mm -hmm. and they support each other. It's not, it's not, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. It's not the focus on the family, mom, dad, and the two and a half kids hanging out by themselves. It's what that looks like in relation with other people 
in, in this community of faith. And I, it's like to create these things. I think that there's an analog, speaking of analog, there's an analog here to how the spiritual communities can, can develop. In fact, in that book, we honestly, at the end, uh, my co-author said to me, do you think these young people will ever go back? And I said, honestly, no. And uh, I said, I, <laughs> my most cynical side says, don't worry about that. Focus on the ones you have and create a space where everybody feels safe and honored and has a place and a thing to do there. Amen. And you probably will have a better success. Wonderful. So let's do this because we're our time is wrapping up um, and we've tried to um, engage questions and comments throughout the conversation. Um, so I want to give all of our panelists a moment to just kind of give final thoughts. And if you do have a, a pressing question, go ahead and drop it. We see all the comments, uh, but if you have a pressing question, put it in the chat and we'll try to get it answered. Um, but go ahead. Uh, we'll start with uh, ladies first, Heidi. Um, <laughs> in, <laughs> any final thoughts or a final charge to uh, all of us? Um, and then if there's a pressing question, uh, go ahead and put it in the chat. No, I just wa want to say, I mean, I think this is a very exciting time, you know, to be. Um, I think a lot of churches have been, are exhausted. I think everyone's exhausted in a sense, because it's just been a time of increased change and experimentation. But I'm hoping that the new life comes out of that for many churches. Um, and I think, you know, um, churches, because they've been forced to engage with technology, are now seeing technology in different ways, rather than as a threat, as an opportunity. And I hope that that continues, because even if churches decide to drop their um, digital services, the understanding they have digital culture, they can't drop that because it's the way the world works. It's a way, especially young people learn socialization skills online and then take them offline. It's not like Gen X and, and, and above me who did it the other way. And so we need to keep that in mind. And um, I just encourage you, um, uh, uh, the e-books the e I have are all free. And it's really kind of my kind of gift, especially people who work in church congregations to say, these are some things we've learned the last 20 years, and they might be helpful resources as you think through moving forward into these uncertain times. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Heidi. Uh, Pastor Greg? Yeah, I, 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 I kind of second what Heidi said. These are kind of exciting times, new times, entrepreneurial times. Uh, these are times of, for discernment and discovery. These are times for creation. And, 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 and remember, like, I think all of us are doing what we can with what we have. And uh, you have to be true to you. Uh, you have to be true to the summons on your life in the context and with the people that are there with you. And I think that's really, really important. Um, it's obviously the noise is easy and it's, uh, it's, it's loud and it's easy to get swayed and, you know, and then go off. And, but you got to be true to who you are. So discernment of oneself, discernment of the community that you're in, discerning of neighborhood, and uh, really the summons in your life is really key to all of that. Um, I would, you know, naturally say, I think uh, we got to be, and I, I'll just say it again, it's just the language I use. I think we just, we have to be border walkers. I think we have to be people that are living the both hand and see the beauty and the gift of what uh, culture and the world is offering us today as people that guide people um, in their faith formation. Wonderful. Thank you. And Bishop John. And then we have one last thing we want to do with everyone. So don't log off just yet. And then we'll be done. Bishop John, okay. final thoughts? Well, I would say that after, let's think about this this morning, after the euphoria of attending church on Easter and churches and attending churches once churches get back to in-person worship on a regular basis, after that wears off, because I think there is an initial excitement and celebration, but I, I sense that it's going to wear off. And I'm going to make a prediction, but I'm not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet. Okay, so, and, uh, but I'm going to make a prediction that the habit formed over the last 12 months of not attending church will be hard to resist for a lot of people. So there will be the first wave of, oh my gosh, we, we can get back to church. But I think over these 12 months, habits have been formed and people have become accustomed and used to not going to church. And I think over the long haul, that's gonna be hard to resist, especially among our generation. Um, and that will be a new challenge for the church. Yet it's gonna present an incredible opportunity uh, to reach our constituents and non-constituents in a new way. 
creating a new community going forward. And finally, I, I, I want to affirm those who, who uh, have made a decision to close their doors. It's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, some churches have made a, de a decision that, you know what, um, we're going to close our, our, our campus, we're going to close our doors, and we're going to do ministry another way. Mm -hmm. Some people were paying a lot of mortgages and they had heavy mm -hmm. overhead with personnel, mm -hmm. and they made a decision that, you know, uh, I don't want to spend my time fundraising and manipulating and twisting people arm to give so I can underwrite my budget. Um, and we're going to go, we're going to do ministry in a different way. We're going to do ministry in a, maybe a different community. And I want to affirm those who have simply said, you know what, uh, we're going to close our campus. We're going to close our doors and we're going to do ministry in a different way. I want to affirm those who basically have said, Hey, we're going to have both. We're going to continue to be online but we're also going to create space for people to come in a safe environment. If they want to wear their masks, especially, I, you know, I'm one of those mask wearers. So uh, if they want to come and, and be part of worship, and, but we're going to do both. We're going to appeal to those who stay at home. We're going to appeal to those who need that to come in, 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 in the present. And I, all, present. I also want to affirm those who simply say, you know what? It's all about the church. It's all about the four walls. Whatever works for you, whatever helps you to reach people, I want to affirm you and say, do it. Okay, so that's all I have. Thank you for that, Bishop. And thank you, uh, Pastor Greg and uh, Heidi. We appreciate you so much. We're going to do something called a Mentimeter. Um, and you'll see there on your screen um, the 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 log, I mean, the um, URL is also in the chat. And so you'll be prompted with, I used to think and now I think. So if you've not done this before, many of you have, you go to www.menti.com and the link is there in your chat. You'll put the code in and then you'll enter, I used to think and now I think. And we'll take a couple of minutes to do that. And then after we do that, I'll bring back on Richard Floyd, who will give us our closing remarks um, for this uh, morning. So I used to think and now I think. And you will see the your responses populate on the screen as you put them in. So you're going to go to www.menti.com um, and then put in your thoughts and um, and then you'll see it begin to populate um, on the screen. And uh, and you'll put in the code that's there, the eight nine. One five zero one nine three. Uh, I used to think it's content. Now I'm rethinking my definition of content. Wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, and there are no right or wrong answers, and these are anonymous, so you don't have to worry about um, anybody saying, "Hey, would they say that?" <laughs> I used to think we were not ready for digital worship. Oh, it's the fly. Uh, now I think we are called to it and our mission will continue because of it. Wonderful. I used to think that tech was the end of community. Now I think we can find a way to use it better and strengthen it forward. Yeah, I had that thought too. I thought uh, digital was within community, but we've actually done a pretty good job at Word of Encouragement Church. Um, I used to think that gathering together was the only way to have authentic community, and now I think community can be revisioned, re envisioned um, to be more inclusive. Absolutely. I used to think digital media were distractions. Now I think we can be effective tools to complement um, on persons' relationships. These are wonderful thoughts. Um, I used to think I have to be one way or nothing at all. Now I have to be more expansive and, and understanding how we're called to worship. Churches were too stuck in their ways to change. And now I see hope in their willingness to adapt to technology. Awesome. So go ahead and keep populating your responses. Um, Richard Flory, I'm going to give you the floor as you give us our final thoughts as people are still putting in their Yeah. Um, their these, are, these are great responses. And I really appreciate these and happy that we're making, that, that our panels are making people 
think a little bit differently. And I think that's what we really, our, our goal for these conversations has been since we started them last fall. First, I want to say that we have more program, additional programming coming that we're going to take a couple months, few months off to, to further develop that. We're going to keep these conversations going as well. I'm not sure how many there will be in relation to the other, but ultimately what we want to do is produce a group of church leaders who are, want to develop and maintain thriving congregations, which is still a fairly open uh, definition at this point. Um, and, and, and just to go to be a learning committee, not unlike what we're doing here, hopefully in person at some point, but um, we'll see how that goes. Um, my final thoughts based on today and linking actually more broadly to this notion of thriving congregations. First is what is thriving? And in, the way we've thought about it, I, Heidi brought up this idea that, that I think this is absolutely right, that most people think of, I think the, the common imagination of Americans about church are mega churches. They don't think about the small churches, the medium-sized churches that are doing really good and interesting things in their communities. And I think the measure of thriving tends to be that mega church with a gazillion uh, ministries. And as one person I interviewed years ago, told me a, a staff of thousands. Um, there are many other ways to be a, a vital or thriving congregation besides just large size and many resources. Um, I want to give you something that Greg did not give you. And I, last time he and I talked, which was a year, gosh, I think maybe September or October of uh, 2019, actually. I was, I was in Portland. We we're talking about these kinds of things, and um, and he told me that. And one of the things that impresses me about about Greg's efforts have been that he's he's always when I've known him in a couple different locations, his church has always been as much in the community as as a as a as its own community of faith. And he told me that as one of the things they've done is they go out in their community and they talk to people around their church building, and because their church is broader than that, and. He, they were told by somebody in the community, and I will edit this a little bit, um, that they 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 introduced the people introduced to themselves who they're from, and they said, "Oh yeah, you're the church that gives a care." Substitute a, a word for care in there if you want, because that's what they said. And I said that would be a fantastic church church T-shirt, um, uh, and because but I think that's a measure of thriving. Mm -hmm. How much do you care? internally for the lives of your of your members and externally for the lives of your community mm -hmm. and how much of a presence are you in those in those both of those spaces and i think everybody on this panel today has talked about those in different kinds of ways and i think that's really really key to this notion of thriving congregations the other th final thought i would have and it relates back to the book i quoted that i published a long time ago and one person I interviewed told me that, and this was in the in the the period of the um, the emerging church movement, and and when people there was a lot of conversation about that, when people were kind of upending things and established institutions were threatened by the emerging church, and the emerging church was trying to figure out what they were going to do. And I talked to, I was at this event, and I interviewed this this guy who's still active and very you would know his name if I told you, because I actually told him this quote. He goes, I don't remember saying that. Um, but what he said was that the, the, the way they were, the, the people he was working with and in conversation with were thinking about church was as, it, as an organic body. And, this, and, and what Pat, uh, Bishop John said a few minutes ago about some of the churches that decided to go out uh, in the pandemic, this is important, important acknowledgement as well. And, and he told me that they were thinking about church as an organic entity, had a birth, a life, and a death. And sometimes they need to be put to death. And Greg actually did that in a former church. And you can read our book for an account of that. Um, but Bishop John said, and, and Greg said exactly pretty much the same way, which was he put it to death, the church to death, because they felt that God was done using them in that space, in that place, and that there was new things to, to happen. And I think that's the part that's really interesting. And I think death may pre, pre, you know, preclude, not preclude, but um, preface thriving. 
All that to say is, I think the ability to ask questions, to listen, to be adaptive is key to churches and faith institutions of all sorts moving forward in an increasingly digitized world where authority is challenged, but it's also given new opportunities. How do you empower people to be parts of these congregations such that they want to be there and that's, a, that's their community and that, that they participate in? So those are my thoughts and they're kind of random, but I'm very grateful for this conversation. I think it's a key conversation to end this series that we've had this past year. And then we look forward to doing more again and also working with, with whoever decides to want to work with us and um, go from there.